Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Pink Sheets Farmer Regulatory Podcast. I'm Derek Ingery, a senior writer at the Pink Sheet, and I'm joined by Pink Sheet senior writer Sarah Carlin Smith and executive editor Matt Hobbs. Month three of coronavirus teleworking is now upon us, and some states are beginning to open back up. We're wondering if any of you feel like you're ready to start going back to work or other places that you may have frequented before this all started. I know I'm comfortable taking walks and maybe getting takeout, but I don't know if I'm ready to necessarily go to the mall yet. What do you guys think? Well, I think this is uh, certainly maybe the uh, the first week where I uh, uh, can't pretend I don't need a haircut. So I'm looking forward to uh, um, to that. And, uh, um, you know, as uh, um, many people uh, know, you know, clippers are completely sold out online. So uh, I'm out of options in terms of uh, um, kind of needing uh, um, some relief in terms of the uh, uh, my uh, my my ragged uh, uh, hair. So uh, um, that would be nice to uh, to get. But uh, I'm kind of with you in terms of uh, restaurants and uh, um, you know, other kind of mass gatherings. As long as it's sort of nice outside, I certainly hope to be able to see uh, friends and family, uh, you know, sort of kind of uh, in a wide open space. But, uh, um, I, you know, restaurants and uh, um, other indoor stuff still make me nervous. Yeah, I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of in the same boat. It seems like we're a little ways away from sort of um, engaging in kind of luxurious activity. <laughs> <laughs> Things you don't really need to do um, seem like we're pretty far away from doing that. And most stuff should be avoided still unless, you know, it's really more essential. Yeah. I'm still going back and forth on whether I should get that Brad Pitt buzz cut if I can ever actually find clippers. <laughs> <laughs> Since that they're all like back in fashion now. So, so. but uh, first up this week is the search for a coronavirus vaccine. One of the things that will allow us to feel more comfortable in crowds again. Uh, CBER director Peter Marks said that vaccine development programs ideally will include randomized clinical trials, but he added that those decisions will depend on whether the virus is circulating when phase two and three trials are ready to start. So if the virus is circulating, a phase two or three study could be set up using real world evidence, comparing different waves of vaccinated patients, he said. Um, he admitted the design's not perfect. He actually said some of his, I think he said some of his uh, friends at NIH would probably <laughs> yeah. not like that, not like that at all. Uh, but he said the real issue is trying to get things to move quickly. Uh, Marx also said that sponsors would be going through what he called, quote, meticulously rapid development, unquote, and gave this analogy, which I really liked. He said, if the plane has to take off quickly, the pilot doesn't necessarily throw out the pre-flight checklist. He just goes through it fast. So he said vaccine development will be kind of done in a similar way. So, Matt, this this approach seems kind of like the way the the ideas that they're talking about for therapeutic development with coronavirus. But does it concern you at all that this is kind of the best way they see to develop a vaccine at this point? Well, I'm certainly uh, um, with you all on the idea that sort of a vaccine would uh, provide a whole lot of assurance, and uh, um, you know, hopefully uh, um, we can get one quick. So uh, um, you know, uh, um, we all uh, uh, like things to be ideal, but. Uh, um, Given that uh, you know uh, um, the economy is shut down and you know sort of people are uh, um, uh, people are dying, uh, you know things are obviously less than ideal, and so uh, you have to go with the solutions you uh, um, you have. To uh, paraphrase uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, you know this wouldn't be the first time that FDA did something less than ideal. I mean they've uh, um, uh, always sort of kind of tried to uh, um, adapt to uh, um, you know the best data they can get and uh, um, you know make a. Uh, um, Make a valid decision. I uh, um, I thought it was a great interview that our uh, um, uh, colleague Kate Rawson did with uh, um, uh, Dr. Marks there, and uh, you know I think the the audio that's uh, you know in this podcast feed if anyone wants to go back uh, um, back to that uh, um, you know uh, um, uh, um, I uh, um, I don't know if it's uh, uh, going to all uh, work out as smoothly as everyone hopes. Uh, Sarah did a great uh, story a couple weeks ago about how this. Uh, um, very aggressive timeline, uh, you know, uh, for uh, vaccine development may not be realistic, uh, but uh, with so many candidates coming along and uh, everybody really focused on it, it could actually uh, turn out to be, uh, you know, with all those dice and uh, um, everything rolling, uh, you know, one of them could, uh, um, could really hit the jackpot. So uh, hopefully that will work out. Uh, um, uh, uh, I think as we've talked on this podcast before, uh, I'm not so much worried about sort of kind of what uh, um, FDA sets up in terms of uh, um, design or sort of kind of uh, uh, companies not taking it seriously, 
But what if there are sort of kind of ambiguous results or kind of what does the agency do with that? What's the political, you know, pressure to sort of kind of to just sort of move forward with the product? Uh, um, you know, that's sort of kind of where I sort of kind of start to worry about sort of kind of things kind of not, uh, you know, going as uh, um, as productively as uh, perhaps they could. One of the things I thought was interesting about the Marks interview was, um, I think the number is 70 about ca candidates in development um, for vaccinations. And he didn't seem too concerned about the competing pressure of all those candidates. And he felt like it will just sort of, the marketplace will work itself out in terms of ensuring that the best ones rise to the top and we're not, trials aren't kind of competing for patients in a way that hinders the, you know, development or the best development pathway for the ones that are, you know, the most promising. So I thought that was kind of interesting that he feels like there maybe doesn't need to be a ton of government um, intervention to kind of ensure we're prioritizing the best ones. Because um, as he sort of indicates, depending on whether the pandemic is ongoing or not, is going to impact the amount of people you need for your trials and how fast those trials could get done. Um, and of course, the ironic situation is we want this, we want the disease to kind of wane as fast as possible. On the flip side of it, the faster the disease wanes, the harder it's going to be to get the most ideal clinical trials. So experts, you know, I talked to said, well, a pandemic is actually the best time in a way to test a vaccine, because at that point, you can actually test those really hard endpoints like prevention of disease, or if you get the disease, less severity and so forth. Um, as Marx talks about, once the disease wanes, then you may result at looking at, you know, do you, you get an antibody response. Um, and that that's great, but we have to, we need to then have some follow up to make sure that actually means once the disease does rear its head back, assuming it does, people really are protected and um, I know every like in the same way people would like to think if you've had COVID, you're immune next time. We don't know that for sure yet. Yeah, I mean, a, a fundamental question for me is if this uh, immune response actually doesn't sort of kind of create, uh, you know, long term uh, immunity in people, you know, sort of how uh, how will a vaccine work? Uh, um, you know, so uh, um, we'll see how that uh, how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I, sir, I liked your comment about uh, you know 70, 70 candidates in in um, you know in clinical trials and and are you competing for patients and 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 that kind of thing. I mean, I think there's been acknowledgement already that um, we're going to need probably more than one vaccine in general, just because you know more than one company to design these, just because what the, you just won't have the capacity to ramp up one for the entire you know, planet, so to speak. And, um, you know, the question may be like, if, if one gets developed that, you know, provides like 70% coverage and another one is like 50% coverage and another one's like 30% coverage, are they going to, you know, how are they going to handle that? Are they going to say, yeah, let's produce all of these and we'll see, you know, if, you know, maybe we'll give, you know, depending on the types of patients, maybe we'll, we'll, you know, we'll kind of separate who gets, you know, determine who gets which one or something along those lines or you know it's it's just it's an interesting problem that they're going to have going forward yeah this is going to create a lot of um you know this global i think political battles and you know um yeah. debates you know because you know every country is kind of going to want th these products for their citizens and how everything gets get divvied up is going to be quite interesting um and, you know, you can see some of this sort of starting to play out now in terms of where the manufacturing facilities are mm -hmm. going to be built and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, the issues we've already seen in terms of sort of uh, drug supply will only be uh, uh, more acutely felt in terms of uh, vaccine supply, in terms of sort of kind of countries perhaps uh, not wanting to uh, ship it uh, elsewhere if they feel they need it uh, themselves. So. Yeah, that's that's like the next the next question slash headache with, with all this, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. the, the never never a dull moment again. You know, in this in this whole fight. So, next up is a package I wrote on the FDA's approval performance since coronavirus mandated mass teleworking. We looked at NDA and BLA approvals and ANDA approvals and found that while NDA and B BLA approvals dropped once the pandemic ramped up. 
generic drug approvals increase compared to the prior to to their prior performance. One interesting aspect of our look at the data was when the change seemed to be happening. Beginning March 10th, when Cedar Director Janet Woodcock sent out a memo indicating that non-essential travel would be canceled and preparations for widespread teleworking were starting, and stretching through March 18th, when Commissioner Stephen Hahn said that all staff who were eligible would be teleworking, NDA and BLA output plummeted, while at the same time, ANDA approvals spiked. There are, there are lots of things that can affect approval volume, and we have to say that up front, and a lot of it's not under FDA's control, but Sarah, are you surprised at all that it seems like the transition to telework affected workflows, at least initially? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there's a couple of aspects I think you mentioned. One is just obviously the Office of New Drugs did a lot of shifting around to try and pull people where they could to work on coronavirus. Um, and then you have to think just the transit, the initial transition of people kind of getting set up in a new work environment probably slowed things down. So. I think it'll be interesting to see going forward, do things kind of veer back to, to normal now that we're maybe you assume FDA is kind of more set up for this new circumstance. Well, yeah, that that is one thing we saw was that, you know, we had like this this week or so, week and a half, and you know, where it was kind of like stopped. And then you see the the numbers shot back up again. It was kind of like like what you said. It was like, okay, everybody kind of figured out their home working routine and then they kind of figured out how to talk to each other the best you know the most efficient ways to do that and then all of a sudden it was like okay now we can you know work and continue on as as best as best as best they could or whatever yeah that uh, rebound is certainly in uh, encouraging although fda has acknowledged that the uh the amount of effort they're putting into uh, um, the coronavirus response, working with the, you know, these unprecedented number of sponsors and sort of all these trials that are uh, that are going on that we've written about, uh, you know, is for kind of putting a burden on their uh, um, non-corona uh, 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 virus activities. So, uh, um, um, you know, they haven't sort of missed any uh, user fee approval deadlines yet, but uh, it could be that sort of kind of because of all these sort of kind of the, the meeting delays and sort of kind of other sort of challenges they are uh, um, they're starting to face that uh, um, the you know, the approval sort of could uh, could start to slip because of that. But uh, the fact that there has been a rebound is a very encouraging sign. And the, and the meetings the meetings issue is is another one that we looked at uh, with this, which is kind of interesting. These little subtle changes that you're seeing. Um, I had a one expert uh, or one uh, attorney tell me that um, the way teleconferences are. They 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 used to be allowed. They're they're they were allowed previously before coronavirus, but now even teleconferences themselves are being changed in the aftermath. Um, and, and you know, again, it's something you don't really think about, but it's kind of a you know essential thing. Like he's uh, what they told me was that they would all be in the same conference room for the teleconference, and they would you know they would be talking, and someone would bring up an idea, and they would say FDA would say hold on a second, and they would put the call on hold, and then they would like confer amongst themselves, and then like a couple minutes later, come back on and say whatever the answer was, their opinion of that was. Well, if everyone's in a separate place, you can't have those kind of discussions unless you have like, you know, our, our software has a little chat function, but I don't know if you could frantically chat that fast, you know, <laughs> do, doing something like that, or text everyone, you know, on their phones or something to do that. So it's, it's kind of like this different experience now. And, you know, there's like, and, um, you know, for on, on some of these calls, and you wonder if they're getting, you know, there's this some, if some communication just can't be, um, you can't get some of the things across that you wanted to get across, you know, you used to be able to get across a lot easier before. Yeah, it seems like um, in those situations, companies may end up getting the same information back for FDA, but probably delayed after the call, I would assume. So mm -hmm. things probably move a little bit slower. Yeah, and, and you see too, uh, I'm sure it's it's happening a lot of times where um, senior officials who are scheduled for these teleconferences will just say, I can't, I can't make it, I got coronavirus stuff to do, or I got this meeting, that meeting, whatever. And there's and the FDA is just saying, hey, you can we can have the meeting, but you know we can give you written answers too if you want, or you know instead if you want that. And I think a lot of sponsors will take the written answers because they get the senior uh, level opinion as opposed to the teleconference without the senior person. So which is you know 
if you're if you're looking for direction on a development program, that's probably going to be a big deal. Um, you know, just getting that those slots, you know, from people. So, so finally today in our non-coronavirus uh, news, Sarah's going to take us on a trip to the donut shop. Geez, uh, well, I made myself hungry just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, um, I don't have donuts to share, and if I did, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be allowed to share them. But um, I did look at a um, a study that tried that tried to examine the impact of the Affordable Care Act's closure of the Medicare Part D coverage gap, which is more often ca called the donut hole for seniors. Um, about ten years later, they looked at um, the study looked at rheumatoid arthritis drugs, which are fairly expensive, biologics. Um, basically, they found that because the price of these biologics have been increasing year over year, the impact of closing the donut hole for these seniors is not really being felt. They're still actually paying, um, if they're only on these RA drugs, they're probably paying a little bit less than they were in out-of-pocket costs in 2010. But it seems like that um, savings is going to diminish. And the authors of this study have looked at other categories of therapeutics that are high priced, like cancer, and have found those patients are already paying more um, than in 2010. So it's just in, it's an interesting thing to think about for the drug pricing debate, because um, you can see there was this policy developed to try and um, give seniors some relief on their drug pricing costs. And while it probably did offer that relief for some for a little while. It's, you know, things creep back up again and you have a new problem to solve. Um, I should actually, I should add a caveat that, you know, the authors acknowledge if you are a senior who is taking lower price drugs and a minimal amount of those, you probably are still getting some benefit from this policy change. But it's this, it's the people that are on these, you know, specialty drugs, which we continue to see more and more of it that face this issue. Um, and, you know, one thing, um, of course, there's always a coronavirus angle to everything these days. Before COVID-19 rolled into town, we um, were seeing a lot of action in Congress or discussion, at least, on drug pricing and potentially making some tweaks to the donut hole that would help these seniors, including just putting an out-of-pocket cap in Medicare Part D. And um, for better or worse, it seems like all that work is going to be probably pushed off quite some time now. So um, how this all shakes out is going to be remains to be seen. Um, and COVID, of course, may actually cause more people to be thinking about drug prices, certainly prices for COVID, but also we have this economic downturn, and that means more people are going to have trouble affording their medicines. So, so is yeah. this... I'm sorry. Is this a is this a pricing problem or is it a policy problem? Oh, that's a good question. I think um, it probably depends on who you ask. And a little, okay. <laughs> and uh, and probably you could argue it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, in talking to folks, I did make. I was saying, you know, well, 2010 was 10 years ago. You would expect probably prices for most things rise over 10 years. Yeah. So. Um, you know, that's probably f fair to some extent. I think people said, well, it's it's the rate of the price increases mm -hmm. maybe that they saw as concerning. And also in terms of the policy and structure of Part D, I think the concern is that what happened with the redesign in Obamacare is um, as part of the closure of the donut hole, which is basically seniors used to pay 100% of the drug costs in that phase. Now they're all the way down to paying 25%. As part of that, drug companies and even insurance plans agreed to kind of contribute somewhat to that. Now, the, the discounts drug companies give count towards a patient's out-of-pocket cost. Um, and what happens there is that then speeds seniors through this coverage gap or donut hole into the catastrophic phase of the Medicare benefit, where they actually pay a lot less for drugs. But because the prices are so high, that 5% is still a lot. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening in that phase of the, of, the, of the Medicare benefit is the government pays 80% of the cost right now. And so that means that if seniors are getting sped through there and we have more people getting to that phase, taxpayers are on the hook for more of Medicare's costs. 
And then on the other side, that usually ends up going back into premium somehow. So, you know, Medicare Part D is just such a, um, it's a, it's a fun <laughs> benefit to look at because they're just all these like inputs that, you know, I mean, one woman I talked to for this article who did the study talked about, you know, it as a boat with all these holes and you plug one hole it leads to another hole and another hole and the boat's mm -hmm. still sinking anyway. I mean, people talk about the health policy framework in this way as a balloon a lot. You know, you you squeeze one end and then the other end just kind of bloats up. Yeah. Um, so I I think uh, MedPAC has thought a lot about this and oftentimes and they've had sort of a sweep of suggestions of how to design Part D to try and make sure, you know, that when you fix one problem here, you don't lead to other problems there. And it's really a big, big compilation of changes that likely are needed to deal with all these problems. Um, again, the question is, once Congress gets to it, do they appreciate the need that you can't just, you know, make that little tweak here and expect everything to work out well? Mm -hmm. It, it's really like sort of mind boggling <laughs> how messy it gets. <laughs> and then, you, you know, you expect seniors to try and figure out what the best plan for them is. Yeah. <laughs> it is funny how this, uh, um, you know, was basically sort of kind of this budgetary fix when they were creating the uh, the Part D plan, the donut hole to kind of, kind of help uh, the government spend less money has sort of kind of created all these sort of, kind of ripples of uh, complications. Not that sort of, kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, private insurer based, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, insurance, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, through employers isn't uh, complicated either, but it's sort of this, this extra layer of sort of kind of this kind of uh, unique uh, um, uh, pay payment uh, process is, uh, um, is a very, uh, is certainly, uh, you know, sort of keeps, uh, um, it keeps policymakers from kind of uh, tinkering with it. So it'll be interesting to see how we can uh, eventually fix it. Uh, you know, just like I haven't had a donut in, uh, you know, uh, um, many months now, uh, you know, we, this alternate universe, we were expecting this to be sort of kind of the big uh, topic of discussion, you know, drug prices going into a presidential campaign and, uh, and all that. And now it's sort of uh, um, something that's sort of kind of, we uh, we're kind of setting aside and probably not going to worry about for, uh, um, for a while, but obviously it's a, it's a real problem for anyone uh, trying to pay for those drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think um, people think that also, you know, COVID-19 is really going to reset people's thinking around drug pricing because the industry is playing such an important role in the COVID response. Their reputation is improving. Um, they seem like they're being very thoughtful about how they price any products for COVID. So that may really shift where this debate goes. Again, other people have pointed out that, you know, it may shift to who policymakers think they need to be helping perhaps the most when they do drug pricing reform. So, um, you know, while seniors and Medicare has been a big focus of the debate, you know, the people that are hurting economically from this crisis um, are perhaps going to be more folks on private insurance because they've lost their jobs. Um, so, or, you know, it may kind of shift where um, lawmakers think about focusing their drug pricing attention if they ever get back to it. <laughs> well, and, and you may, they may, the industry may be able to use this as kind of another example of the amount of spend that they go through to develop a drug because we're really seeing it in real time kind of now. I mean, I, I'm, I'll be really interested to see kind of if there's any way to kind of do an accounting of what a lot of these companies are, you know, their costs for rapidly developing and you know i mean they're throwing clinical trials together you know in days you know and and running them at warp speed and you know i can't imagine what the overtime and you know and and the you know just the the distribution costs and the production costs and everything else that goes into it i mean it's going to be it'll be interesting to see if you know they can you know justify you know a lot a lot of these and you know kind of the are we going to get you know, are people going to start believing the whole it costs a billion dollars to develop a drug um, you know, type of argument again after seeing what, you know, what this is, you know, this process has led us to. And the manufacturing, all this at-risk uh, manufacturing yeah. capacity will be interesting to see how that shakes out for industry <laughs> over the long run. And maybe do people have an appreci a different appreciation also, I think, for drug manufacturing after this is over? Because I think one thing that's always interesting in the drug pricing debate is people start, um, 
talking about drugs at some point, almost, I guess like they're a commodity and they start talking about them as like, you know, it just costs like $12 to produce this pill or whatever. And they sort of ignore all that upfront initial investment. And perhaps there's, I guess, some point where you could say the company has recouped that. But at what point I think people are probably getting more of a real time education now about the, um, the amount of work and money that goes into this initial development and um, production stage. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna see, and we're see it with failures too. I mean, we're seeing in real time. You know, everything doesn't always work. I mean, you know, look at all the, the you know with hydroxychloroquine and all the advanced purchasing and donations of that. And now there are serious questions about whether you know that's going to prove to you know to be effective or not. So, yeah, one of the uh, the arguments about drug pricing that uh, industry had always uh, used was sort of kind of the long. Uh, uh, horizons they they had to sort of, kind of invest over you know 10 to 15 years to drill, develop a drug and uh, you know all that money put in and it never sort of kind of uh, um, I think convinced people uh, to, to the extent that they were hoping it uh, um, would in terms of sort of kind of uh, um, justifying the uh, the pricing but now you're sort of kind of uh, seeing that same expense for kind of squeezed into a matter of months and they're sort of uh, you know I certainly sort of uh, would love to see some sort of, kind of wasteful spending on uh, you know speculative manufacturing or something that was going to work out in terms of a mm-hmm. vaccine or a treatment sort of please uh, ramp that up uh, even if the the trials aren't done and obviously sort of government programs are sort of to uh, to de-risk that would be uh, um, would be very helpful but uh, you know I think there could sort of be a uh, a dramatic shift in uh, multiple directions, as, as you have both observed, that sort of A's for kind of people may have a new appreciation for sort of kind of, you know, pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals really sort of can transform lives in uh, profound ways for the better and sort of kind of, or you can also sort of kind of, you know, go back to, uh, you know, concerts and uh, sporting events and everything because those are kind of, so those developments, that's, uh, um, that's a great thing. And, uh, um, you know, on the other hand, that sort of because of the economic tumult that this has, has produced, sort of people are really going to be sort of squeezed for, uh, you know, paying for, uh, you know, routine costs as uh, as well in terms of sort of kind of the basic treatments they need to sort of kind of, uh, um, you know, get around with their lives. So, uh, um, you know, industry will really be cross pressured as this thing uh, um, plays out. Yep, sure, certainly. Well, that's all for this week. For more, check out our website at www.thepinksheet.com. You can also find this in previous podcast episodes on iTunes or SoundCloud by searching for Pharma Intelligence Podcasts. And if you're so inclined, feel free to give us a review. Thanks again for listening or watching the Pink Sheet Pharma Regulatory Podcast. I'm Derek Inquiry with Sarah Carlin-Smith and Matt Hobbs. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.